Greetings, America. It's time we had a serious conversation about citizen equality. Now, wait, wait. I know this is long and not exactly the most enjoyable topic, but it is probably the most important conversation our generation will ever have. So bookmark this, put it in a calendar, and make some time to watch it with family and friends. Because if you have even the slightest bit of love for our country, you will want to see this. All right, so I want to begin with this entertaining quote in Orwell's Animal Farm where a pig says, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Now while we might chuckle at this, what we all should be doing is asking ourselves, as citizens, are we equal? To that, we might say, well, yeah, of course, because we all have the freedom of speech, we have the freedom of religion, we have the right to assemble, we have the right to bear arms, we each get one vote, we're all entitled to due process under the law, and nobody escapes all taxes. Yet as citizens, are we still equal? Well, here is what Harvard Law professor Lawrence Lessig has to say in exploring a run for president that is focused exclusively on citizen equality. He says, the core principle of representative democracy is that we are all equal citizens, and that corruption creates second-class citizens. And by corruption, he isn't talking about the narrow definition of directly exchanging money for favors, which is already illegal. He's talking about institutional corruption, which he defines in an earlier paper as follows. Now, I know that this is a pretty long and complex definition, so let's break it down and see how it might apply to Congress, and more specifically, to the House of Representatives. So what is institutional corruption? Well, it begins with a systemic and strategic influence which is legal or even currently ethical. So for the House, we can look at the systematic growth in contributions to winning campaigns. Impressive, right? Just imagine a time when the average cost of a winning campaign was less than $60,000 as compared to today, where the average is now almost $2 million, pushing the total cost for winners towards a cold, hard billion dollars. And when we look at the more recent distributions of these contributions, what we find is that the amounts under $200 are completely insignificant while elite amounts totaling over $2,700 have now overtaken all other individual contributions. On top of all that, we have political action committees, or PACs, which are not the same as all those super PACs of dark money you've been hearing all about. This is just the money that is given directly to candidates. Another way to look at this is to see how back in the 90s, elites gave less than 10 times as much money as those afforded by the middle class. But by 2014, they now contribute 233 times as much money. And this is showing no signs of stopping. In addition to perfectly legal contributions, we also have perfectly legal lobbyists, whose numbers have grown prodigiously since the 70s. Along with the spending on lobbyists, which now regularly tops $3 billion. Okay. So now that we have two aspects that just might have a little systemic and strategic influence, let's ask whether or not it is undermining the effectiveness of Congress in achieving its purpose. And for that, we can look at the number of bills enacted, which have been steadily declining in blue, versus the total number of pages in red, which have grown substantially. Now what this means is that the average number of pages per bill has been steadily increasing, which is why we now have representatives telling us that they have no clue about what is in the bills they are voting on, because they are too big and too complex, and they simply do not have the time to read them. But are these increases actually biased towards anyone? Well, when we look at the tax rate for the top 10% of households, we do see a steady decline. And as a result of this and other related factors, when we look at household incomes, we see that the middle class has grown only a little and now appears to be totally flat at around $50,000 per year, whereas the top 5% has enjoyed significant growth. Put another way, back in the 60s, the top 5% only made four times as much as the middle class. Not too shabby. But around the 80s, things really took off to where they are today in making over six times as much which roughly translates into an average $4,000 to $8,000 pay cut for the middle class and a $40,000 to $800,000 raise for elites. Okay, so what about that last part? Has this weakened our trust in Congress? Well, according to polls of that very question, yes. Our trust has gone from an age when over three quarters of the population trusted our government to a time when barely 20% of Americans have any faith in the institution. And when we look at voter registration and turnout during midterm elections, which is a good baseline measure of our overall political participation, 
we see that the numbers have grown more slowly than the population, which means that the percentage of people registered and going to the polls has been in a steady decline. So as citizens, are we still equal? Well, to provide a definitive answer, we can now look at the landmark study done by Gillians and Page that evaluated decades of history to discover what Ezra Klein called the most terrifying graph about democracy. Now, you might wonder what could possibly be so scary about a simple straight line, but what this is actually saying is that when nearly 0% of the population cares about a reform, 3 times out of 10, something happens. And when people are unanimous, meaning that there is something nearly everyone really cares about, there's still only a 3 in 10 chance of something happening. But when you compare this to elites and interest groups, we find a very responsive Congress that avoids issues that elites are against and that takes action 6 out of every 10 times when it comes to something they really want. Put even more plainly, this means that the vast majority of Americans now have, quote, only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. Okay, so when I ask this question one last time, as citizens, are we equal? We can now say without any shred of doubt that the answer is no. No, we are not equals. We are in fact now living in Orwellian times, where we like to say that here in America, we are all equal citizens. But in truth, some citizens are undeniably more equal than others. Okay, by now I can imagine many of you are nodding your heads and saying, yes, I've heard a lot of this before. I get it, but honestly, what can we really do about it? How do we fix it? Well, if you've been paying much attention to this issue, you would already know that there are a lot of groups out there pushing for reforms from a number of different angles. And this is great because problems like this require a lot of exploration. Yet I also think that each group out there would be the first to admit that they alone do not have a complete solution. Now is the time to put it all together though. Now, I promise, there is a really good answer to the question as to how we actually restore equality. But in order for you to truly believe it, we first have to answer a different question. And that is, how did we get here? Here is the answer. Now, I know this might seem too complicated to understand, but we will again take it one piece at a time. What this diagram represents are the major feedback loops of a system dynamics model that puts together all that data we just looked at and more to provide a mathematically complete explanation of the rise of institutional corruption and how we got to where we are today. From there, we can then use this model to actually look into the future and see how different policies work and which will be the most effective in restoring citizen equality. All right, so the first set of loops that we will look at are called crony capitalism loops, which are all going to reinforce or amplify the growth of corruption, and it begins with the notion of elite favoritism in Congress, the Gillians and Page measured. This favoritism is driven by elite influence, which is in part determined by our representatives' dependence on large dollar contributions. These contributions come from elite political investments, which are based on elite income. Now, when Congress crafts policies that are favorable towards elites, the elites profit, which provides even more income for future investment. This completes our first reinforcing loop that we call elite influence. It is worth noting that reinforcing loops can work both ways. If Congress were to write less favorable policies, then elites would have less disposable income, which would then lead them to focus on other more profitable investments. The overall behavior, therefore, is a function of all the feedback loops in the system and their respective gains, that is, their levels of amplification or reinforcement. Okay, so the next crony capitalism loop is based on the policy inputs of registered lobbyists which is a function of their cost and the funds available. These funds also come from elite political investments, which closes our second reinforcing loop that we call lobbying gains. And these gains are hugely lucrative, which is why you see industry investing over $3 billion into lobbying. How lucrative? Well, in some studies, these gains have been found to return anywhere from $220 to $760 for each dollar invested. 
That's like becoming a millionaire or multi-millionaire practically overnight just for investing less than $5,000. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right, the last loop in this set here is a small balancing loop that helps to achieve the desired number of lobbyists through the allocation of spending, which is itself balanced by the fact that lobbyists can demand lucrative salaries when there is $3 billion on the table. This is also why half of members now leaving Congress go on to work for K Street. Okay, so the final part of the crony capitalism loops is the leverage that comes from the current level of transparency in Congress. Now wait, isn't transparency supposed to be a good thing? Well, this effect actually turns out to be really important because it is almost entirely responsible for determining the relative gain of all these crony capitalism loops. So pay attention. So what is this leverage? Well, it goes back to a principle of democracy that is at least 2,000 years old, when Aristotle described the Athenian ballot that was used in ancient Greece, which included tokens for secret voting like these. Now, as much as we all love and hail transparency, we also know that too much of any good thing can actually be really, really bad. And what millennia of history has told us that in some cases, secrecy is absolutely crucial to good democracy. Why? Well, back in ancient Greece, it was to protect jurors against revenge from the accused. In the early British Parliament, it was secret voting that prevented against retaliations from the king, which is why the founders borrowed the practice when they were defining the procedures for the Committee of the Whole in the House of Representatives, which is where all the important tax and spending bills are crafted. In fact, even the Constitutional Convention was held in the utmost secrecy in order to prevent subversion, and from which Benjamin Franklin emerged to be angrily asked, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? To which he replied, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And ironically, here we are today, having done that very thing. Okay, so in the very first Congress through the next 181 years, much of the voting that took place during the process of writing bills actually occurred in secret which allowed representatives to focus on what best served the people without fear of any retribution from funders or other established interests. But in 1970, with the stroke of a pen, Nixon set into motion this little regarded sunshine reform that discarded this crucial principle of good democracy and created electronic voting that could now record the identity of every single vote in Congress. After the appeal of ultra-transparency faded, many former proponents went on to conclude that bills were actually better when they were drafted away from lobbyist watchful eyes. Now, some of you might be thinking, intimidation and fraud in Congress? Come on, how bad could it be? Yet when you start looking at it, what you will find is that the problem is really actually quite widespread. Some of the most stark examples include the unprecedented amount of arm twisting that took place in the passage of Medicare Part D, or that time when there was a bill in Congress that had whole paragraphs that were copied word for word from the lobbyist recommendations. And let's not forget about when party leadership told its members that they were watching their voting patterns and that if they did not toe the party line, they might not get that committee assignment they really wanted. It is precisely this kind of leverage that ultimately determines the level of amplification in the cronyism loops. And right now, the gain is cranked to 11. Okay, so that is crony capitalism. Now what about the people? Well, they are currently dominated by the elitism loops, which this time are actually reinforcing a decline in many of the important factors related to equality. The first of these begins with the effort that politicians put into contacting wealthy donors, which according to a number of leaked memos can range anywhere from at least 30 to as much as 80% of their time. This translates into spending two to six hours every single day just dialing for dollars. Crazy. All right, so now we can figure that the amount of effort they put in is in part a function of the total amount that candidates expect they need to win as compared to what they have already raised. So if they're short, they obviously have to put in more time, and if they have plenty of money, they have to put in very little time. How much a campaign is expected to cost is determined by the relative price of advertising, which is in turn affected by voters' trust in government. That is to say, that as people grow more and more disgusted with politics, the more they try to avoid political messaging. 
which means that candidates then have to spend more and more money on ads convincing this shrinking pool of voters just to show up at the polls. Okay, so trust in government is then related to the ratio of policies that favor elites as compared to the policies that favor everyone else, which completes the first of our elitism loops that we call voter engagement. The next two loops are based on the size of middle class small dollar contributions, which rise and fall in relation to voter trust in government to form the reinforcing loops we call voter participation. The next loop adds the relationship to middle class income, which determines how much voter influence there is over policies in Congress. The final loop is then another small balancing loop, which ensures that the campaigns only raise what they expect they need to win. All right. So when we put this all back together, what we see is that with all the elitism loops pushing voters down and all the crony capitalism pushing elites up, we now have a way to precisely measure the overall direction that our country is headed. So that when I ask the question, how did we get here? We have a definitive answer. All right, so let's go look at the model. So after entering the model, we'll see that we're set up to do a calibration run that goes from 1960 to 2015, so that we can compare it to the data over time that we looked at earlier, along with other data points. So when we run this, we can now go from model sector to model sector to see how well we match all the data that describes how we got to where we are today. So for campaign expenditures, we can see that there's a good fit to the increasing cost of campaigns. When we go to contributions, we see a good fit to the amounts there. And in the next sector on lobbyists, we're tracking the number of registered lobbyists well. We then have corruption, which is mapping the ratio of elite contributions to those of the middle class. We have the time that politicians spend, as well as public policy, which is tracking the pages per Congress, as well as the overall number of pages in the Federal Register. In the sector on income, we see that the ratio of the top 5% to the middle class also tracks nicely. And finally, we have the trust in government, as well as the declines in voter turnout. Okay, so now that we have a model that is properly calibrated to how we got here, we can now finally ask, how do we fix it? Well, fortunately, there is already legislation that has been proposed in Congress that includes three different policies that we can now try out. The first is a voucher system that provides a $50 rebate per election, so $25 per year, for each voter. The second is a small dollar match of either 6 to 1 or 9 to 1 for amounts under $150. And the third are media cost controls that set the lowest unit cost for campaign ads. Yet this bill is still missing a very crucial part, and that is the leverage that elites and lobbyists enjoy from being able to see precisely who is delivering on investments to stuff favorable policies into bills in Congress. To counter this, we propose a fourth policy, which makes the process of crafting bills secret and shifts the focus of transparency onto the final bill. Because let's face it, average citizens are not ever going to watch every move in Congress, and even if they did, what leverage would they have on a daily basis? It is only the quality of the final bills that actually matters, and that is what we should be holding members accountable for come election day. If representatives could craft bills away from the microscope of vested interests, history has told us time and again that they will deliver a much better product. Okay, so let's go back to the model and start looking into the future. All right, now we can set the model to run to 2016 and run a business as usual case where we make no policy changes to the model. And after saving that, we can now try out some policies. So first we're gonna try vouchers. Now before discussing the output, let's look at how it was implemented in the contribution sector. So what we did is in the year 2017, we gave a $25 voucher. And when just a quarter of those people that show up to vote use these vouchers, we were able to actually publicly fund elections for a number of years. But because the campaign expenditures continue to increase, the policy of vouchers is eventually overcome and elite contributions become important again. So that's why we see a temporary dip in the income disparity as well as a small bump in the trust in government. All right, so let's save that and go on to small dollar matching. Now when we run this, 
you'll see that there's not much change between the business as usual case. There's a very small shift. Now even though we implemented a more generous 9 to 1 match and we applied that to contributions under $200 instead of just $150, when the contributions of elites are already 233 times as much as those small dollar contributions, a 9 to 1 match really isn't going to make much difference. And even though this might play an important role in providing seed money for political outsiders to start getting their campaign going, it really is an effective policy in solving this in the long term. So we're not going to even save it. We're going to reset it and move on to campaign cost controls. Now after running this, we can see that the way that we implemented this is to set the cost control rate after 2017 to grow at just one-tenth of a percent as opposed to the 1.5% that it was growing at prior to the change. So and by doing that, we see that the cost controls are able to slowly redirect income disparity, but it really doesn't have much of a change on our trust in government, and it takes a fairly long time for elite contributions to decline. All right, so now we can try our final policy, which is to reduce leverage. Now to implement that, we did is, is within the corruption sector we have this value and the way that this effect works in the model is that it determines the relative strength of all those crony capitalism loops and at the beginning of the model in 1960 this value is set to one but after the passage of the legislative reorganization act we double the value to two then in 2017 we reduce the value back down to 0.8 to say that we can provide maybe even better effect than there was in the 60s by ensuring that there's the right amount of secrecy on the process and a better amount of transparency on the product. All right, and when we do that, what we see is that we are able to stabilize the growth in the income disparity, as well as our trust in government and to an extent the elite contribution ratio. But this change is nowhere near strong enough to overcome all the effects of those reinforcing loops. Okay, so now we know in more precise terms than ever before how we got here and what each policy can do to restore citizen equality. All we need to know now is what is the master combination? And for that we can go back to a few final model runs. So after resetting the model we can run our business as usual case again and save it. And we can start by doing a combination of vouchers and campaign cost controls because those are the ones that are already on the table in Congress. And when we run this, what we are able to see is that we now have a sustained decline in the dependence on large dollar contributions, a slowly growing increase in trust in government, as well as improvements over the long term to the level of income disparity. Now in the final run, we can combine these two measures with our reduction in leverage. And when we run that, we'll see that we're finally able to really address this income disparity and get back to levels closer to what we had in 1960s, that our trust in government can be restored, and that over time we can really reduce the dependence on large dollar contributions. All right, so if you made it this far, congratulations. You now know without any doubt that right now we have lost citizen equality in a big way and that is hurting each and every one of us outside of that tiny group of elites. Yet this is not a problem without a solution. In fact, the solutions are really quite simple because they do not infringe upon freedom of speech and expression, which means they can be passed in Congress right now. This means that when someone asks you the question, as citizens, can we really be equal again? You can now answer yes. Yes, we can have equal representation in Congress once again. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Please feel free to visit brucegarin.com to download the full paper, data, and models that were used in this presentation, along with this presentation itself. Then remix it, share it, do whatever you can to bring our nation back to the people. Because after decades of corruption, we still have a ton of work to do in fixing this mess. But once we take care of this first problem, then as Lessig promises, great things, American things, will be possible once again.